Five years on from the untimely death of Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, we ask, what's the next big thing to follow the iPhone and iPad? And as Morocco prepares to go to the polls, what kind of government, what kind of policies will emerge from the voting? I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Hello, welcome to Insight. With a market value of over $600 billion, Apple is the juggernaut of IT companies the world over. Five years ago, Steve Jobs, the company's innovative leader, died from pancreatic cancer. He'd been central to the polished icons of 21st century computing. The iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, and created a vast ecosystem of mobile applications. While its flagship handset might be Apple's cash cow today, the next few years are likely to see the company explore other areas for growth. Insight's Ty Genwright explains. And today we're introducing the iPhone 5. It was 2007 when Steve Jobs launched a product that would change his company and the tech world. The iPhone has become the biggest selling consumer product in history helping Apple to become the world's most valuable company. More than a billion have been sold. It was, like all of Apple's successes, Steve Jobs' brainchild. And while the iPhone 4 was the last he launched before his death, his legacy lives on in the devices launched since then under the stewardship of his hand-picked successor. I am so incredibly proud. Tim Cook had worked with Steve Jobs since 1998. He's credited, in part, with the turnaround of Apple after it nearly went bust. But how has he performed during five years in the top job? They've been steady, they've been solid, but maybe slightly unremarkable compared to the Apple of Jobs' career, where it was a bit more stagement, a bit more showmanship, a bit more pizzazz and hype. I think, yeah, from a market perspective, it's been exactly what you've seen, the transition from the excitement, the growth company element, if you like, towards the more boring company element. They've, they've established themselves, they have the ecosystem, they have the dominance in the market, and now it's about cementing that dominance. Cook has brought plenty of new models of old devices to market, but only one that's truly new. Devotees hoped the Apple Watch would change our wrists like the iPhone changed our pockets. But sales have disappointed. Apple has never revealed how many it sold. I think people weren't quite sure what they wanted from a watch and when it came out people were unsure but that's the sort of whole wearables market in general. It's still one which is very much in a developing stage, they're more of a vanity item where smartphones you can make a genuine case that you need one in day to day life now, they're so entrenched in our lives. Smartwatches, wearables, they're not, they're, they are sort of a pleasure purchase. Shouldn't we though have seen more new products at this stage? Apple never rush out new technology. A lot of the stuff that they innovate and they bring to market is, is stuff which may have existed before, but in a, a more raw form. They're, they're very good at perfecting stuff, making it really easy to use and understand for the consumers. And stuff like a, a smart car or it, uh, their own brand TV, that's stuff that there's also really heavy players in that market. They'd be completely new to those areas, so it's already difficult for them to break into. So if they were to bring a product out, it would, they'd really have to hit the nail on the head. Perhaps a better way to judge Tim Cook's Apple is not by the gadgets that you take away in your hand from a store like this, but in the regular payments it's now taking from its customers. Not for things that they have and hold, but for things that exist only in the cloud. Around a billion of us now pay Apple on a regular basis for services like iCloud data storage, Apple Music streaming and Apple Pay that gives it a slice of every user transaction. Analysts say that Apple could soon earn a billion dollars in revenue from these every day. But if Apple has to move on from being not quite the one-hit wonder, but the, the iPhone company, if you like, because whatever you say about the iPad, it's never matched the success of the iPhone. Um, they have to draw more people into their system to keep them there. And that's what they're moving on from. It's not just an Apple problem. It's something with Amazon. It's something with, with Google and Microsoft as well. They have to find ways to keep those revenues recurring rather than those big one-off purchases. It's more about the predictability of the revenue stream because when you move from being the exciting company towards being the value company, if you like, you need to be able to say this is where we expect to be in a few years time. Being the world's biggest company also comes with social responsibility.
Tim Cook was the first boss of a major US company to reveal that he's gay. He's also found himself at the eye of a storm in Europe over how Apple pays its taxes. But most notably of all, he picked a high-profile battle with the FBI by refusing to help hack into the iPhone of terrorist suspects. Perhaps Tim Cook's best and the biggest is yet to come. The sports car maker McLaren recently denied reports it was discussing an investment, but didn't confirm or deny any other potential relationship with Apple. We know that Apple has hired automotive experts and expectations are they're working on a car. Apple McLaren could have a good ring to it. Ty Genreis reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined now by the technology expert, Kate Bevan. Let's stay with the idea of where they're going to spend their money. I suppose it might be cars, it, it might, might not. It might be cars. I mean, yeah, Apple is so incredibly secretive about what it does. I mean, it's not as secret as it used to be under Steve Jobs, but there's never any kind of guidance or nudge. And I think the cars thing is interesting, but I also expect them to put their money into VR, into developing AI much further as well. And maybe, again, to trying to come up with a new hardware class because the Apple Watch has been faltering. I mean, you know, iPhone and iPad still sell millions of units between them, but there is a plateauing off there. So it does need to come up with another hardware category really how do they compare we'll go into some of those subjects in a moment but how do they compare with their competitors as we speak Google have just launched their answer to a high-end phone mm -hmm. Does it compare as far as you can see with the iPhones? Yes, it does. I mean, I was at the launch last night and the Pixel phone is lovely. It looks very much like an iPhone and actually it's priced pound for pound and dollar for dollar and I guess euro for euro as well. Exactly the same as the iPhone. So it's clearly in that marketplace. It's a, it's a move into that space. But it's, it's a clever device. It really bakes in the um, Google Now, the, the AI assistant. It's impressive. I was impressed by it. The Siri which is the answer, the personal assistant that Apple have gone, has got better, better, uh, better. I think everybody, even their critics, would say it's better. And it's now going to be part of the computer, the Mac operating system, all that's a relatively small user base. Do you see a future for these things, these things that try and predict what you're trying to ask for? You know, they know what you're going to type into a search well, box even before you type it. We already have that. Um, if you're doing a Google search, for example, it will throw up suggestions that are actually quite useful. Um, if you use a lot of, uh, if you, I'm not sure it's the same on the iPhone because I don't use the iPhone, but on Windows Phone and Android, it learns how you how you phrase sentences. It learns your, your particular words and it will offer them to you. Mm. So we already have that. We already have assistance, machine learning assistance that help us do things, get there before we get there. If you invoke the maps, it'll tell, guess that you're going to work and tell you what the traffic uh, is already. That's both useful on the one hand and slightly spooky on the other. Where do you think users are? with uh, having all this information. I think users are fairly comfortable with it. I mean, there's an interesting sort of, uh, dichotomy there because on the one hand, we are deeply concerned about things like the revelation last night that Yahoo was scanning, its e scanning users' emails on the request of the US government. Uh, we worry about uh, data breaches again, Yahoo, other. But at the same time, we're quite happy to hand over our whole lives to an ecosystem. If you're a, an Android user and you regularly use Google Docs and Google Mail, Everything is going through Google servers, and that's why it serves you up with really useful search suggestions. And we know they're being read, Kate, don't we? Because the Google ads that come yeah. up the next time you search are directly related to the fact you looked about a garden fence the other day, you looked about buying a certain plant for your garden, yeah. and these are relevant to the searches you've just done. So. Are we relaxed about that, do you think, as users, as we consumers? We are relaxed. Oh, I think we are relaxed about it because we don't think about it. We only think about it when something like the Yahoo story last night happens. Um, we go, oh, blimey, do I really want people reading my emails? But then, of course, they already scan your emails, not just for relevant ads as they do with Google, but also for spam. That's how spam catchers work. They scan for keywords, and if it's full of, you know, keywords that are familiar in spam, then it will block them. I suppose them. there's a slightly different feeling, although it may be naive, to think, well, Google is that company that I might be scanning my emails emails or Apple might be reading my emails or whatever. Microsoft might be reading the emails if I use their Outlook service. Um, but it's not a government. The Yahoo story, of course, proves that it probably is a government yes. as well. Yes, I mean, it, that's actually quite chilling because it does show you that A, it can be done and B, it has been done. And I think C, also, that um, 
Marissa Meyer went ahead and did it without the input of her tech department, apparently, without her security people. So there's, I think you're right, there is a boundary there. It's about oversight and, and what's going on yeah. in that company, isn't it? But then it? it is, I think, basically the same technology underlying it. And what we end up think, talking about is where do we draw the line? What are we comfortable with? Do we want to be protected from terrorists? Yes, probably. Are we comfortable with the Yahoo reading our emails? Maybe not. That's a conversation that we're still having. VR, we mentioned, um, virtual reality. We featured it on this programme as well, once uh, the various glasses and um, Oculus Rift came available. Do you think this is an area that would be good for Apple engineers? Because th they're quite good at taking technology that, maybe not breaking the technology, but then refining an existing technology and making it even better and more user-friendly. Yes, and particularly as Apple is moving very much into content and services as well. I mean, it's clear that that's where it's directing a lot of its... Um, it, its development at the moment. So yes, it's absolutely in Apple's interest to come up with a really good VR experience, and I'm sure they'll do it well. They are good at that. Whether VR is the thing, I don't know. I mean, it makes me seasick. A lot of people are telling me it is. I do know. You, do you think it is? I honestly don't know. I mean, it makes me seasick, so it's not ideal for me. But I can. We see should just explain. This is when yeah. you put in a really immersive pair of goggles, really close to your eyesight. You can see nothing else except this virtual world which is created for you by, by a computer. So um, that sort of thing could take on, but do you think the market will be relatively small then if some people don't like it? I think it's actually going to be quite big in industry and maybe in medical applications um, for doing virtual surgery, things like that. I think there's lots of potential there. And actually, I'm sure there's a huge potential with it for gaming as well. But whether it's going to be enormous and ubiquitous, I don't know, because it's actually quite... Um, it's an experience, it's a singular experience, whereas we're very focused on sharing, um, sharing things we do, sharing things we watch, um, algorithms to share. So it strikes me as slightly counterintuitive to that move. The augmented reality is a halfway house between that, isn't mm. it? When you are actually in the real world, but extra data, like a head-up display, mm -hmm. Um, or I'd be all right, I could put them straight through onto, onto my uh, spectacles, yeah. I suppose. Uh, that kind of technology is an interesting area. Again, maybe ripe for Apple's exploration? Yeah, possibly, again, because they do it well. Because, of course, Google did that with glass, which has now been shelved. And that didn't go down very well because people didn't like them having a, the camera on their side and not knowing what you're doing. But there's a, a lot to be said for a, a harder heads-up display. Things like Pokemon Go is, of course, augmented reality. And that was hugely popular for the five minutes it, you know, <laughs> it flamed. <laughs> <laughs> what about mergers and acquisitions? on the business level. They have so much money in the bank, they could buy several small countries if they wanted to. Um, people talk about Twitter being vulnerable to a takeover, but the question is, Kate, does anyone want to buy it? Well, does anyone want Twitter indeed? Uh, you know, it's... Uh... Twitter is enormously big and important for the likes of us, who journalists, um, people who need to know what's going on. Uh, Twitter was very busy when I came out just now. But for the wider thing, it's not making any money. And this is the problem. Nobody knows how to monetize that because Twitter seems to be particularly resistant to ads uh, and ads working there. So, I mean, who knows? Yes, and there's the McLaren car project as well. So that might be another area they That's expand. That's really interesting. And as you say, Apple's got so much money. The problem is what they, how they do it, use it in a tax-efficient way because it's all offshore. If they repatriate it to the US, they're going to have to spend, pay lots of tax on it. Well, we shouldn't maybe get too embroiled no. in the <laughs> tax affairs of Apple, of course, uh, as well. Um, we mentioned content creation as well, because the other thing they could do is if they want to keep our eyeballs entertained. Mm. What about a movie house? What about a whole television company? What about a global television company? They've got the resources to do anything. They've of those got the things. resources to do that. They could also do something like become um, an MVNO, which is a virtual mobile network operator where they sell mobile phone services with bundled um, content from you know, whichever channels they partner with rather than buying one. There's lots of opportunity there for Apple to really get into the content business as well. And um, yeah, that makes a certain amount of sense. And they'll probably keep on making phones, won't they, for the time being? Yeah, that, that's, they're not going anywhere. They may be plateauing a bit, but they're still shifting in the millions. Good to talk to you, Kate. Thank you very much indeed. This is Insight. Coming up, Moroccans go to the polls.